Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Hi, Dr. Jake Porter here, your host of Betrayal Recovery Radio, and I'm really excited to introduce this episode to you. Today, I am in Wisconsin at the beautiful Green Lake. In fact, let me just turn around so maybe you can see some of the lake there. Um, I'm here with the faculty of Kairos University, where I have the joy and the privilege of teaching in their master's and doctoral programs. And... um, And uh, Green Lake is is wonderful. I learned today that it is the deepest lake uh, in Wisconsin, which makes it the largest by volume. So it doesn't necessarily look like it would hold the most water if you're just looking at the surface of it, but it runs deep. And let me tell you something, this episode is going to run deep as well. Since I'm out of town this week, I'm pulling from the archives of the 2022 Choose Connection Summit, where you're going to get to hear an interview between Dr. Wendell Gill, one of my teammates at Daring Ventures, and Julie St. Onge, who is a certified partner coach with APSATS. She's a registered nurse, and she's the founder of New England Coaching Services. They're going to be talking about adding attunement to empathy. And in Julie's interview, she's going to discuss why attunement is so important, how it can be developed, and the three C's of nonverbal communication, which she names as context, cluster, and congruency. You know, it's been said that only about 7% of what we communicate is with our words, and yet we focus so much on words, even in the tools that we teach or we learn, Uh, as we're seeking to recover from the effects of trauma and betrayal. Really, though, so much of what we communicate is through signals, micro-expressions, facial reflexes, breathing patterns, little noises, all of that kind of stuff. So developing attunement to your partner's signals prior to the need for tools can really change the energy between partners and create safety in the relationship. So let's go deep now as we listen to my friends, Wendell Gill and Julie St. Onge, talk about adding attunement to empathy. Hello, everyone. Uh, My name is Wendell Gill. I am a coach with Daring Ventures, and I'm really grateful to be here uh, this year in our summit uh, with Julie St. Onge. Uh, Julie is going to be sharing with us about how adding attunement to empathy is critical uh, to be healthy in relationships and healthy with oneself. So, uh, Julie, we're very glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I want to tell you a little bit about Julie before uh, she starts sharing with us. Uh, she, Julie has a bachelor's in nursing from, uh, pardon me, it's Rivere? Riviere. Riviere. Riviere, <laughs> pardon me. Riviere University, uh, graduating summa cum laude. Uh, Her experience involves working in in many fields in nursing over the last 20 years, about 20 years, labor and delivery, postpartum, surgical, uh, working in walk-in clinics, just surgical day center, uh, all of which indicate she's had a lot of experience working with people in pain. So Julie attended the World Coach Institute where she obtained her life coach certificate uh, she's brain spot trained and has completed all phases for certification to do brain spotting. And she's currently working with a few brain spot trainers to advance the proposed model of couples brain spotting for hurting couples wanting to heal and build connection. Julie is APSATS and CSASE certified. She also sits on the board of directors for APSATS. Uh, Julie also coordinates the annual APSATS conference and is the founder of the New England Trail Trauma Conference and New England Coaching Services. Julie's very busy, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, 
she's also published a guide for facilitating disclosures, a helpful guide for clinicians in finding healing through the betrayal trauma model for covenant eyes. So Julie, thank you so much again for joining us. And um, I, I love the title of what you're wanting to talk about today, adding attunement to empathy. Uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing right now and sort of segue into this critical part of that work, attuning, uh, attunement with empathy. Yeah, well, thank you for that introduction. And um, the work that I'm doing is amazing. I love it. I left the nursing field for this, but I still keep my license up, so I use it. Um, but I just, I love the trauma model and helping people kind of break free from patterns that are emotionally destructive. So um, attunement is a piece that I've noticed that is kind of missing a little bit in a lot of plans of care. So I know that we focus a lot on tools to help people to know how to say things so that we don't hurt each other, so that we can empathize and have compassion um, and come together in relationship. But I think attunement is the other piece of, you know, as we get further into this talk, just understanding that um, there's a big part to communication that is non-spoken. So really expounding on that. Yeah, so attunement's more than just words. Yeah. And sometimes just finding the right words can be difficult. Uh, so even if a person has the right words, it doesn't mean that they're just automatically attuned to the other. And uh, so why do you think attunement matters so much in relationships? Hmm. Well, if you use an example of like a mom and an infant, you know, and you're watching them, babies, they don't really have a lot of language except to cry. Mm -hmm. They may have different tones of crying. And a mom who's really attuned will pick up on those different pitches of a cry or the tone of a baby's body. Um, but as she becomes attuned to that baby and gets to know that baby, she can anticipate needs and read the language and speak back a language that will comfort that baby. Yeah. And so if we apply that to our relationships, it's being able to anticipate needs and speak back in a way that will meet that person where they're at. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm thinking about that well-known uh, video that maybe you've seen, and uh, I, I certainly recommend it to some people, the, the still face experiment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, and so you believe that that need to be heard and seen, attuned to, continues into our adult life. Yeah. yeah, 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 and really a lot of it is not just what we say, mm -hmm. but the presence that we have, mm -hmm. you know, and how we present it, our tone, um, how we carry our bodies, and um, our cadence when we're saying it our hands, what we're doing with our hands. We were just in church today and I was noticing um, someone talking and so much of what they were saying was involving their hands. Right. I was like, wow, right. it was right. like changed the whole message if we take their hands away. That's true. <laughs> and they might not even be able to speak if you tied their hands, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, you had mentioned that there's sort of this uh, proportion in terms of what part of speaking is uh, involves attunement, whether it's the voice, the hands, the gestures, the words you speak, so forth. Tell us some of the background of that particular yeah. uh, understanding. Okay, I'm going to use some notes here, and yeah. I did make a little handout for the audience so okay. they can get that and follow okay. along. Um, in the beginning, I just talk about the caution of attunement because I think that we can overuse a tool to the point where it can become kind of distorted. Mm -hmm. um, like if I am over a tune with you, you know, I could read any small facial expression and start to think, oh, I've offended him mm -hmm. or, oh, I, I'm confusing him. And then we're out of sync. We're not in sync, you know, so it's one of many tools. Um, so just to kind of hold it in that space. Um, but as far as attunement goes, um, there's different studies out there that talk about in the, in the earlier studies, they said that 7% of what we communicate is spoken. Some of the newer studies say 30% at any rate. 
a large percentage of what we're saying is um, posture, it's eyes, it's our brow, um, it's the tone of our voice, sometimes grunting, you know, and so you could hear a phrase and it could be said so many ways, like, you know, what are you doing tonight? What are you doing tonight? You know, you could either say it with anticipation or like you're suspecting something. Right. Um, and so being aware of those subtleties changes the message. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that. Um, that's you know, just why yeah, it's important to know even that a, even the as difference you're talking, there. my awareness goes up as you talk about it. I'm thinking, oh, how am I sitting? Do I, do I, do I <laughs> you know, how my brows, you know? Uh, yeah, I can. I, I really appreciate how uh, the idea of being over attuned or overwhelmed with uh, the, you know, small idiosyncrasies of, of expression and gestures can, can definitely kind of be overdone, I guess. Uh, yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's very fascinating. Um, and so, it's like that idea of relationship being a dance. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you've heard that quote. And oh. and it's like, am I stepping on their toes? Are they stepping on my toes? How does this feel right now? And that's attunement. It's the feel of ease and of safety. Um, and Gottman, John Gottman says that it's actually the foundation for building trust. So, so it's big. Yeah, it, it is huge, and and so I'm really glad that you that you use the infant uh, setting because I'm wondering if uh, how the extent of trauma, perhaps in infancy or early childhood, would impact one's ability to or motivation, certainly to yeah. to even be attuned with anyone else. Yeah, I like to consider um, some areas where attunement is going to be hard, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you could start right down to the basics of um, someone that may have Asperger's mm -hmm. or autism. Mm -hmm. They may struggle to be attuned. They may miss some things. They can also still um, develop that through different therapies and early intervention helps with that you know but if you look at childhood abuse um abuse with adults trauma brain injury there's so many things when you're dealing with relationship in the brain that can impact your ability to stay attuned um you know a, take abuse for instance it can really make you question yourself others the world around you god to the point where you can lose that ability to be a tomb. And it's still there, but you stop relying on it because it feels as though you can't trust it. You start trusting a system that's kind of made up. So how would one actually develop then uh, a tomb? Let's just say, you know, even notwithstanding those type of barriers, and there are many, as you pointed out from traumatic brain injury to uh, being on the spectrum uh, to uh, to abuse. Uh, so how would one generally uh, approach the need to develop attunement for the sake of their yeah. relationship? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about that, but can I share a quote with you that yeah, I just please. read today? Okay. Yeah. This is a Diane Langberg quote, and she talks about attunement and she says, well, she's referring to it. She says, trauma has a profound spiritual impact. Trauma raises questions about who God is. Victims are uncertain of his character, his faithfulness, his love, his capacity to keep us to be our refuge. Trauma um, mutilates hope. It shatters faith. It turns the world upside down. Um, and so it, it's really it it twists and turns things and for believers that have started to feel like they've lost their faith um i would encourage them to to lay off the shame that this can be part of a process of deep hurting and god hasn't let go of them um but if you look at judith herman's work and Bessel Bessel van der kolk they talk about community and how important that is. And actually, 
both of them in um, in Judith's book, uh, Trauma Recovery, and in the uh, the Body Keeps the Score, both books discuss um, veterans from Vietnam and talk about the disconnect that trauma can cause. And if you've ever seen a traumatized veteran, they're way out of tune. They're not a tune, they're out of tune. And so they talk about getting in safe community as a starting point um, to realigning. So in the, in the handout, if we skip ahead, um, some of the ways that you can become a tune is, is safe community. That'd be the biggest one. Um, but if I, if I get into the three C's of, of, um, attunement, yeah. that might help people understand, kind of break down attunement and understand how they can, you know, say you're with your spouse. You're like, I have no idea. I don't get them and they don't get me. Where do you start with that? Um, in the handout, I use Jeff Thompson and he actually is probably not somebody anybody's heard of and if you look him up you're going to find a couple different jeff thompson's right. yeah. um but kind of fascinated me he actually was doing negotiations for the fbi for hostage situations hmm. so if there's ever a person that needs to understand a two minute right. now it's that person because if he missteps there could be a death um, and so he said to use the three C's, context, um, cluster, and congruence. Context, cluster, and congruence, okay. Yeah. Okay. And if we apply that to relationship, um, I could see that being helpful in, in, I'll give you an example. Say I'm with my husband and we are at um, the 4th of July fireworks. Mm -hmm. And he's really kind of, you know, he thinks he's talking in a way that's really calm, but I'm sensing like a tone that's, that's got an undercurrent of anxiety or a kind of aggression. I'm trying to figure out, is this me? Have we had a fight that I didn't know about? Is there a trigger here, a temptation here? Um, sometimes just stepping back and saying, what's the context here? Well, for my husband, he has military trauma. So the context might just be that the fireworks are loud and they trigger him. And it has nothing to do with us. Um, but also looking at clusters of behavior. Was it one moment that there was a little snap? Some like a fleeting moment that felt overwhelming to him? Or is this something that's going on? And I can kind of pinpoint five or six moments that seem off. So we need to talk about it. So I guess that would be like picking your battles versus letting it go, you know, so seeing if there's cluster there. Um, and then congruence would be, are you seeing match with words and, and behavior, or is there a big disconnect? And that might be another area to just talk about with your spouse. So I think looking at the three C's is helpful in um, just trying to know is how to start attuning to your spouse. Is this a situation that will activate them? Um, what are some signs that they may be activated and try to pick out more than one if you can. Not to build a case against them, um, but to try to, to be curious. I like that word curiosity because I think it helps us to understand each other. So can I ask you a question about the cluster? Part. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit further? The uh, and, yeah. and I think in in context, of course, that's just the broader context of what's going on and what you may know about your partner in this case. And in your case, you're talking about knowing your husband has, you know, uh, military uh, experience and perhaps some battle background. Uh, and the, and he knows there's supposed to be some loud noises. That probably already has him on edge. Good good yeah. point for context and congruence. I think you're talking about. Uh, is their voice tone and their words congruent with their body's position and right? Is that kind of what yeah. you call it, congruence? Yeah. Okay. Tell, tell yeah. me a little bit more about the cluster part. That that part was not uh, sure quite as clear to me anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say like, say we're pulling up to the field where mm -hmm. the fireworks are. Mm -hmm. And um, so say before we even get there, I notice at the house, he's kind of, in a whirlwind, he's lost his keys. There's agitation. There's um, a feel of a mood leading up to the door, even to leave that feels anxious. 
And then that continues and we get in the car and um, driving, there's irritation there, you know, or there's short behavior or he's not able to hear people. There's more behavior. So cluster is like more than one thing that tell, that's telling you something is wrong. Sort of you like know, say, aggregate of things that are happening and you're like, okay, right. this is a cluster of feeling here or, yes. uh, or misattunement, misalignment that's going on. And so something's yeah. happening. Okay. Yeah. I think it helps you to not overread, mm -hmm. you know, like if you're sitting with your wife and, and she was, kind of gives you like a look or hesitates on something, but then that moment passes and she seems okay. Um, I think that there might be something to like overreading sometimes where couples get into fights because mm. they start talking out these little tiny cues that meant nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes clusters are important, like watching, but you have to watch and you have to slow down mm -hmm. and study yourself and other people. Sounds like there's a lot of wisdom there in terms of, uh, so it's sort of the three C's seem to provide a wisdom template for attunement. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm thinking about guys I work with. And I work with a lot of addicts that are in recovery and now they're trying to recover their relationship in a way that where they're finally learning intimacy and so forth. A lot of them will definitely be over reading their wife. Well, mm -hmm. she's she's sad at something. It must be something I did again. Well, when in fact it's because, you know. Uh, she heard some bad news at work that day or something. Right. And so, uh, yeah, I really I find that to be very profitable. Yeah. From Jeff Thompson. Jeff Thompson. Okay. Yeah. And I'll skip to the end here because I mm -hmm. actually give uh, tips for attunement. And I say get in community that's imperfect yeah. and practice mm -hmm. because, you know, and you'll know if you're in a community where you're, you feel like you can't make a mistake mm -hmm. or you're not allowed to talk a whole lot or you can't just be yourself, that might not be a good place to practice attunement. Mm. Um, but with people that you can be silly with and be yourself with and relax and kind of grow and learn, um, it's a great space to start. Yeah. Um, and then I say, slow down. Grounding is huge. I don't think that that is emphasized enough in the world of recovery for, for addiction or unwanted behaviors and also for partners. Um, when I lead groups, I, I have everybody start grounding with me. Um, and when I say that, you know, they get nervous and they're like, oh, are we talking Eastern? You know, what is this? Yeah, and I basically, Eastern mysticism. Or Eastern <laughs> mysticism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I say, no, we're just pulling all the parts of your brain online mm -hmm. so that yeah. the signals sent downward are signals of wellness. Right. You see the verse back here on my sign right it says yeah. be still and no right so no we're talking about we're talking about good truth yeah just being quiet yeah. for a moment yeah <laughs> and that's a that's a word that i use a lot with grounding is just give yourself permission to just be because sometimes people will think i have to have peace i have to have confidence and they they get anxious about these things even about trying to get peaceful but if they just give themselves permission to be, they can slow down and feel their body, mm -hmm. slow down that inner anxiety. Mm -hmm. Then you can start to really hear and see. Um, there's a great children's book called The Rabbit Listened. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read it. I just bought a couple of copies, but this little boy is searching for mm -hmm. someone to hear his heartache. And he finally finds a rabbit who listens. Mm -hmm. rabbit and listen. okay. Yeah, and I think Got that down. <laughs> yeah, it's just to have to be able to listen, mm -hmm. hear, um, be aware of your cues. Mm -hmm. You know, are you because I think when partners face each other to talk, there's often a, a high amount of anxiety between them. Mm -hmm. So just being aware, hey, I'm needing a couple minutes just to ground myself before we talk. Um, or if you're single or you're starting over, like, and you're just having trouble functioning in the world, just knowing you may have to ground in your car for a few minutes before you go somewhere. Sort of take time to slow down and breathe. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You, mentioned, you mentioned about partners a moment ago. Uh, how have you seen this approach help partners with their connection, particularly uh, if there's been 
trauma in the couple, betrayal trauma, perhaps. Uh, what, what have you seen when as to how they can use or have you seen them use these three C's? And tell us a little bit about what you've seen with that. Yeah, I think it's just helped them to find a gauge mm -hmm. of kind of like it, it's cutting down on conflict, actually, mm -hmm. because they can interpret each other's behaviors in a way that makes sense versus distortion. You know, trauma can cause a ton of distortion. Um, if you look, there's a video on my website where it's a cartoon video, but they, they show this one cartoon who's looking at another person's face and completely misreading their face. And, and they've shown in different studies that you can even see a different face on the other person based on just the trauma that's projecting forward. Um, so it, I think it cuts down on distortion. It can help you just slow down and know what you really do want to say and communicate and being in sync um, so that you can have kind of a healthy platform to work from. So I, I really like the idea. It, it, it serves as sort of a gauge. I like that a lot um, because I know as, as I have the opportunity to teach primarily men, but sometimes, uh, you know, uh, a lot of couples I work with, but working primarily with men about this issue of attunement and leaning into uh, your partner, even when they're hurting. Uh, a lot of times it comes up that they're just scared. And, and what am I supposed to do? And I love the way that the three C's can serve as a gauge. There, there's, yeah. there's some things to consider here. May not may not be a reason to be too anxious about this right now. Is it a cluster, you know, or is it just one thing? You know, that's yeah. that's that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. And I think a lot of times, if I'm speculating correctly, that fear is fear of rejection, fear mm. of failure, mm -hmm. fear that. I may misread them and cause a mess or lose them, fear of a poor outcome. And sometimes the grounding can even help with that, like really searching, what are my fears right now? What am I afraid of when I start to become attuned to my partner? Yeah. And you know, am I afraid uh, of a connection? Getting into that other question, I, I definitely wanted to ask and uh, talk the fear of rejection in particular. But the, but the question about, you know, what, what people struggle with in applying these, these attunement strategies, fear is, is huge. And I guess, um, you know, the more that fear mechanism has been activated through some sort of traumatic, traumatic as, aspect would make it even more, more difficult for them to move forward. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And if they haven't had, you know, EMDR or brain spotting, um, and there's so many therapies. I mean, you know, just to rattle off a couple based on the studies I've even seen recently, um, equine therapy, and these aren't just for kids, you know, it's like one of the top three um, is animal therapy, mm. art therapy, play therapy, laughter, mm. um, you know, tracing is another one, just safe touch, you know, for yourself, um, but also working out the trauma in your brain so that it, the space is lighter. There's um, there's something you can do online. It's a neural feedback. It's called Mind Lift. And um, I've heard great things about that through the community. Um, I think it's like $1,000 for three months, okay. which sounds expensive, but I, I'm pretty sure normally neural feedback is like $20,000. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard good things about that, kind of lightening that space because when we're talking about attunement, you know, we're talking, I'll grab my foam brain. Okay. We didn't, we didn't rehearse this, but I'm, that's okay. So that's all right. I know you have one of these, I'm sure you do, but the cortex is out here. Yes. So if, um, I'll just use my pointer, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we're in logical brain and mm -hmm. we've got our left and our right, so left, I believe, is verbal, right is nonverbal communication. But in here is the is the attachment piece. Mm -hmm. And this is all subconscious space. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a little it's automated, but this is actually where a lot of trauma can accumulate. Mm -hmm. So on fMRIs, mm -hmm. um, the very space that we generate attachment, like the hypothalamus is right here in the center right. that that secretes oxytocin um 
that where all that trauma accumulates there mm -hmm. it's no wonder why you know if you've either traumatized yourself by acting out or you had a rough childhood with trauma any number of traumas that have occurred can accumulate in your brain and actually show up on scans mm -hmm. so but but the subtleties of attunement are also what we operate out of in that space it's kind of an automated unaware. I mean, have you ever uh, been with someone you. and you're like, they're making such odd faces. I don't think they know it. They don't know they're doing that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it is that, that autonomic response. And uh, and and with that, again, I, I know in, in, in the area where I'm working with guys on primarily relational recovery, they will say it feels so awkward for me to just be quiet and listen. And I will say, mm -hmm. that's because you've never done it. <laughs> it's really hard, right? It's not, it's more automatic to be defensive, right? Or to push back or to overread the expressions on the face. And she's mad at me and I'm feeling rejected because of their own trauma. And they're bringing that to, uh, to, to the task of learning to be intimate. And so, yeah, it is definitely an automatic response that you have to raise the awareness to be aware of, you know, to, to be more conscious of it. And, and, and actually, I think it takes somebody like you, uh, like, like people that work in this field to, to point it out. Are you aware that you, uh, every time you talk, you do X, Y, Z, uh, your voice increases as the, as the longer you talk in its range or, 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 or in, its, uh, in its volume or something? No, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, it, I'm seeing it. Um, wow. Wow. So what are some roadblocks uh, that, that often, uh, you know, become major obstacles for people? Uh, and, and I think you've touched on that a little bit, but um, what have you found are maybe the, the major roadblocks for people to grow in the area of attunement? Yeah. Um, I think you touched upon it there too, defensiveness. You know, I think if, you, if you've been used to having to self-preserve, if a lot of your life has been either under attack or you're in a mental state of kind of victimhood, there's different mental states that we can get in that can make attunement hard. But the benefit to attunement is understanding. Because if I'm attuned with you, I can really get a sense of your deepest needs and longings not just the stuff on the surface that you first present when you feel like, I don't know if this person's safe, I'll just give them a little bit of me, you know? And so it's that more of that concept of being fully known and fully loved. Um, so I think as far as the roadblocks, the challenges is, and I, I don't know if I would say this is a, a roadblock so much as just a caution, is that when we have attunement not to mind read with it you know not to try to fortune tell those cognitive distortions that can come up like assuming you know what someone is thinking or aiming at right. um, because you've read into something in their behavior um yeah, so that, that brings up the, the question. I was just looking back at some notes I'd taken earlier in our earlier discussion. So, you know, adding attunement to empathy. So as a person uh, seeks to attune, there, there's something in it for them, right? Uh, like you said, yeah. as I attune, I will likely have the greater potential of myself being seen and heard, right? So that there's a, there's kind of a mutuality in the process of attunement. Yeah. And, uh, and, and how attunement actually impact, impacts empathy development and empathy in partners. Talk a little bit about that if you can. I, you know, okay. how attunement is related to empathy development. Yeah, I'm gonna start with this quote. Um, it says, mixed messages lead to uncertainty and confusion on the part of receivers, which leads us to look for more information to try to determine which message is more credible. If we're unable to resolve the discrepancy, we are likely to react negatively and potentially withdraw from the interaction. Persistent mixed messages can lead to relational distress. 
Um, and that's just a, it's from a, a research article from Hargi that I, that I copied. And I think that if we look at the three stages of trauma, the first one for kind of recovery is safety seeking. If you're in the safety seeking space and you're trying to decide, do this person's words and actions match? Not just their big actions, their promises, but their subtle actions. And for a lot of partners, they'll say, my gut says something is off. Well, sometimes it's the cues. Mm -hmm. They're picking up on subtle cues that they can't quite say to you in words. It's at that but if you were level you were just talking about, right? Yeah. If yeah. you were fly on the wall, you'd see the cues and you might even be able to say them. Um, when those don't match the words and the cues, it can cause, like the quote said, withdrawal of connection. And distress of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important to try to match them. You know, practice with your coach. Mm -hmm. I practice with my partners and my people. I'm like, try it on me. Like, give it a go. You know, and the first one's like a hot mess. You're like, that's okay. We all laugh. We laugh and we're like, good. We had a good laugh. Let's try it again. And maybe it's three or four times and then they try it on their own too. And like you said, when you've never done it, those pathways are rough. They need, if you keep working on that pathway, it will get stronger and you'll get, you'll get better at it. Mm -hmm. Well, Julie, thank you. I, I wanted to uh, ask you just a couple of final things here. Uh, first of all, if someone wants to get in touch with you, how would they do it? How is that? Um, NewEnglandCoachingServices.com. Okay. There thank should you. be a link there. Right. And I and I think even those who are viewing the summit here will, will have a place of a way to get to you through uh, through our platform also. So yeah. um, and then the other thing is, tell me about the future. Where are you going with this work? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have three children, so okay. I think where I'm going is right now, <laughs> okay. kind, of, right. kind of living day to day. Yeah. Um, but I will say that I think the most exciting thing coming up is the brain spotting for couples. Mm -hmm. um, what I've found is just having couples face each other. Mm -hmm. The whole attachment template seems to rise right up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in brain spotting, we look for a focal point with the eyes. And what I found is that when they face each other, it's right there. And um, and it's not for everyone. It's not always appropriate to do. And sometimes you need to go really slow but it's working on the um the traumas that can come up not even related to each other but from old wounding but it comes up very easily when they face one another so um i do like double brain spotting it's at the same exact time mm -hmm. and i think that's been really exciting and and just continuing to to offer help wherever i can um and be a part of this awesome community well, we're grateful that you have decided to be part of our summit this year. And uh, I've learned a lot here. Uh, I hope that uh, folks will take notes. I particularly love the three C's of nonverbal communication, context, cluster, and congruency. Uh, I'm going to use that, I'm sure. So I appreciate the learning today. And uh, so uh, I think that can wrap up our time together. Unless you, you've got one more thing that you just kind of burning you want to share with everybody. I want to make sure we reserve a little space for that. Yeah, well, I'll say this, and um, I am a believer, mm -hmm. and I, I try to be careful not to force that on my clients. I have clients who are believers and clients who aren't, but, um, and I will say that trauma in my own life really impacted my faith for a very long time, uh, but in looking through, you know, I was trying to find examples of Jesus and attunement. And it was interesting because when you think about it, it's kind of laughable. Like, how could I read his attunement? I wasn't there. I can kind of read about it, but um, to get solid examples and, and what it made me realize is that if we have 7% now, can you imagine what we'll experience in glory? Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. You know? That's amazing. So, well, since, yeah. since you brought it up, I have to say I'm thinking of two immediate examples of Jesus. 
<laughs> uh, I, I know one place where he looked at over the city, right, and thought about the people there, and he said, "Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I, like a mother hen, have liked to have gathered you and mm. protection under my wings." Another time was when he saw the people weeping uh, at Lazarus's death, and he arrived there uh, what they thought was four days late, uh, but he really wasn't late. But uh, but as he saw the people weeping, Scripture says Jesus wept. That's the short mm. verse in the Bible. But those are just things that come up yeah. for me when you talk about examples. I think there's uh, probably a whole lot more that maybe you've discovered along the way too. But uh, just to really appreciate your share today, and uh, and uh, hope to um, hope to see you again in our summit next year. So, well, right. thank you. All right. Well, God bless. Thanks for having me. Take thank care. You. You've been listening to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of AppSats. If you've received help or hope from this episode, I encourage you to share it with someone you know. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jake Porter, and you can always email me directly at jake at appsats.org. I'd love to hear your ideas, questions, or comments about the show. Until next time, keep choosing to use your voice and live your values. It's good for you and for this world.